Best Book Bits podcast brings you Dr. John Demartini, a human behavior specialist, internationally published author with over 40 books, global educator and founder of the Demartini Institute, a US-based private research and educational organization with a curriculum of over 70 courses focused on human development. Dr. John Demartini has studied over 30,000 books and over 280 academic disciplines throughout the past 50 years revolving around maximizing human awareness, potential, and leadership, which he shares on stage in over 150 countries. Dr. John Demartini, thank you for being on the show. Thank you for having me. No problem. Now, a massive fan myself, one of the books that started my catalyst for research in personal development was The Riches Within, Your Seven Secret Treasures Within. So yeah, great, great book there I read over a decade ago. But tell me, let's, let's go back to your original story. Talk about sort of dropping out of high school and how you your sort of story unfolded from there? Well, I was 13. I left home. I tried to continue going to school for a short period of time and then eventually stopped. I failed. I dropped out and um, was a street kid from really 13 on. My love was surfing, but I was in Texas and surfing wasn't Texas wasn't the surf capital, let's put it that way. You had to have a hurricane to surf there at most. And I ended up uh, hitchhiking down to California, down into Mexico, and eventually panhandled enough money to go to Hawaii. And I lived under a bridge, then under a park bench, and then a park bathroom, and then an abandoned car, and then finally a tent. I kept social climbing. And I uh, wanted to ride big waves. That was my, my love at the, my teenage years. I wanted to go surfing. So I was one of those 60s, 70s, long-haired, hippie surfer kids at the time. And um, I nearly died at 17. And in the recovery of that, almost to my 18th birthday, that led me to an opportunity to meet a gentleman named Paul Bragg, who in one night, in an hour of a presentation, inspired me to believe that maybe I could overcome my learning challenges and someday learn how to read and, and uh, become intelligent. And my life trajectory changed the night I met him. And that led me to a whole journey of trying to take a GED and learning how to read and trying to go back to school. And, and lo and behold, I eventually overcame the learning challenges and became a, an avid reader. And I guess I've never stopped reading since. And I never stopped sharing ideas that I learned. So I've been teaching now. This is my 50th year of teaching. And and I just love learning and I love sharing. So that's pretty well what my journey is. I, I, uh, I'm very grateful for the journey. It's been a very amazing journey in my life. Yeah, thank you for sharing the story. And you touched on some of the notes I had. So yeah, you were in a tent. You had a near-death experience. And you met a, um, you seen a flyer in a window for a seminar and you went there was 35 people there and the um the gentleman paul bragg was talking directly to you and uh, one of the messages that he said really resonated with yourself and then you had a dream of doing what the man did and which was teaching and, and traveling around the world for my audience listening right now where are you traveling by the way and talk about your current you live on the world ship is that correct yes i'm on the world now i'm i've just left last night ecuador quila quila or whatever it is and I'm now into Panama City. I'm going to Panama City now. So we're at sea right now. If you just, there's nothing but water right outside that. People ask me, where do I live? And I said, well, do you, where, where's your home? And I said, well, I, I, I don't have a formal home on ground. And they go, oh, I said, I live in a mobile home. Oh, I'm so, so sorry. <laughs> they, they don't understand. But I've been living on the ship. Actually, tomorrow is the 20th year anniversary of being on the ship. So Actually, I bought in 2001 in October, so it's over 20 years, but we actually moved on to the ship right tomorrow is 20 years. Sometimes there's some good-sized waves we, we get to encounter. <laughs> now, going back to when you started your journey of wanting to be like Paul Bragg and, and teach and travel around the world, one of the early things you did was you started reading the dictionary and learning 30 words a day. What did you do after that? What was your first couple of years after you realized you wanted to be a, a, an educator and travel around the world? What were some of the things that you did to prepare yourself and, and your early sort of careers that got you on the track to, to be where you are now? I was 18 years old. I'd taken a GED and miraculously passed that guessing. 
And I tried to go back to school, and the very first test I ever took, I got a 27. You had to have a 72 to pass. And I almost gave up on my journey, but luckily my my mother inspired me with a statement. She said, whether you become a great teacher and travel the world or you go back to ride big waves or return to the streets, your father and I are going to love you no matter what you do. And that was needed at the time because I really, when I failed that test, I thought, wow, there's no way I'm going to pull this off. And that led me to be inspired to want to study and learn and teach. And I got really determined more than ever to not let anything stop me from this. And I went and got a dictionary out and I started memorizing 30 words a day in a dictionary until my vocabulary was going to be strong enough to start passing school. And my mom tested me on those. And I, um, I started to grow my vocabulary and eventually learn how to read. And eventually I just, once I learned how to read, I just like absolutely did not want to stop. I just started doing 18 and 20 hours a day of reading and reading dictionaries and encyclopedias. And then on, for my 19th birthday, right right before it, my mom asked me what I want for my birthday and for Christmas, because my birthday was on Thanksgiving Day, a month before Christmas. And I said, Mom, I want the greatest teachings on the face of the earth, the greatest writings humanity's ever created from around the world, from the greatest minds who've ever lived. She said, you sure you don't want a t-shirt? <laughs> and I said, no, I want to I wanna learn, Mom. So she was blessed to have a brother who was a professor at MIT at one time. He was a chemist and physicist. I called him Uncle Ralph. And as a gift, he sent two giant six by six by six foot wooden crates on a flatbed truck to my home, to my parents' home. And um, I got out and they laid it on the ground and I opened up with a crowbar and I just carried all these books, thousands of books into my room. And I started devouring until I was going to devour that entire library. And I just never stopped reading. And slowly but surely, people started asking me questions in school. I started teaching. By the time I was 19, I had me a little group of students. <clears throat> and uh, by the time I was 20 and I started at the University of Houston, I'd have oh, 100 to 125, 150, sometimes 400 people gathered every day under the trees. And if it rained in the cafeteria, we started having a gathering. And I started doing presentations. And um, then when I went on to professional school, I started doing presentations every night. Whatever I read that day, I devoured, and then I would teach that night. And I never stopped that. I, when I got into practice, I, I taught every night. <clears throat> and that went from a local area to around the state to eventually around the nation to eventually around the world. And here I am now, you know, all these years later, and I, I've traveled around the world, on the world, teaching I've taught in 170 countries now. It's amazing, yeah. Your journey is one to aspire for, and especially, yeah, 50 years on 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 the journey of educating and traveling. And from your early days as well, I have a similar a similar story. I've created the world's largest free book summary website. I've nearly done a thousand book summaries, and one of my things, like yourself, is teaching and sharing education because. At the end of the day, a lot of people, you know, go, we're going to jump into your book soon and talk about some of the fears, but first fear is probably intellectual shortcomings. A lot of people out there do have intellectual shortcomings where they think they're, they've they got a fixed mindset, not a growth mindset, but they don't have the time or the value system where education's on a, on, a, on a value system. They want information quick, but as you and myself understand, as researchers, you really need to invest the time to research knowledge if you really if it's going to stick can you talk about which let's jump into it so the richards within you, you talk about the first fee intellectual shortcomings what are your thoughts on sort of intellectual shortcomings everybody regardless of gender culture or age has a set of priorities and live by a set of priorities or a set of values things that are most to least important in life and whatever is highest on their list of priorities and values they excel at or they can excel at. And whatever's lowest is where they, they'll procrastinate, hesitate, and frustrate. So they're disciplined, reliable, and focused on what's meaningful and important to them, but they're not in the things that aren't. I have a high value on teaching and researching like yourself, and we're disciplined there, but don't get me to cook and don't make me to drive. I haven't driven in 32 years and haven't cooked since I was 24. So I procrastinate, hesitate, and frustrate on anything that's low in my values. In fact, I learn don't do things that are low on your values. Surround yourself with people who love doing them. Delegate it and only do what's really inspiring to you if you want an inspiring life. So 
everybody has an area where they can excel in learning and an area where they're not going to do well unless they link what it is to what they value most. And I do that for people. I, I tell people either go and study what you really love to do or you spontaneously want to learn it or link whatever you want to learn to that. And what I mean by that is asking how is studying this other topic helping you fulfill what's most meaningful to you? If you can't see how it's going to help you fulfill what's most meaningful and inspiring to you, you're not going to retain it. You're not going to want to get it. You don't even want to absorb it. We've all met people that we thought were not important in our life and they said their name and we forgot their name before they finished saying it. And we've also met people that are extremely important to us and the second they said their name, we wrote it down, we recited it and we made sure we recalled it. So we want to learn things that mean something to us, but we don't want to learn things that don't. We don't want to fill our mind with something that's superfluous to what we what's important to us. So the intellectual shortcomings have a lot to do with values because deep inside, they all want to learn what's important to them, but they may not want to be academics. They maybe want to be social. Like Bill Clinton, um, not only is he a good reader, but he also knows everybody's name. He remembers everybody's name. Incredible retention of people's names because that's what's valuable to him, social connections. <clears throat> and some people, it's uh, physical fitness. They retain exactly how to refine their skills to do a gymnastics move. So everybody loves learning. They just want to learn what's meaningful to them. And that may not be academic or book related. So you don't want to ever label somebody learned disabled. You want to find out where they excel. My excelling and learning was not books and academics when I was a kid. It was surfing. <laughs> and so I learned how to ride big waves. I learned and refined my skills and found a way of getting to the North Shore where I could surf every day in high quality waves. So I, I so everybody has an area where they love to learn. It's just a matter of finding what that is. And if you're not in an environment where that's being honored and you're not allowing yourself to pursue it, you'll start to label yourself learned disabled or learning problems or learning, you know, whatever the names. But I find that, you know, like when it comes to reading and summarizing a book, you don't need to be motivated to do that. You're inspired to do that because you love learning and you want to share that information with people. So you'll absorb that. But if I was to ask you, I want you to do a cupcake manufacturing and study um, how to do macrame and cooking for uh, pastries. How, how well are you going to want to learn that? You'd probably go, uh, no, not at all. So you'd have a learning, quote, disability in that area, but not when it comes to the mastery of life or personal development or achieving in business. What's the first thing someone can do to understand their value stack? So you talk about sort of in the book, everyone has a unique set of values, just like everyone has a unique set of DNA and everyone's top 10 values in order is different than anyone around the world if they actually spend the time. So what's the sort of first step that you would do for people to understand their value ladder and what's important to them and not important to them. First of all, on my website, drdmartin.com, there is a complimentary, private, free um, value determination process. I'll go through it briefly here, but I would encourage whoever is listening to take advantage of this thing because it is a very, very eye-opening exercise. It takes about 30 minutes of your time, but I assure you it's worth the time spent. But what I do is I look at if, I mean, I've been studying values for over 44 years now. And one thing I've observed is if you ask somebody what their values are, they're going to tell you a bunch of social idealisms, honesty, integrity, peace, and all this social stuff. I'm not interested in what you say it is. I'm interested in what your life demonstrates. So I created a value determination process based on what your life is demonstrating, not by what you say. Because a lot of people will tell you what they want it to be, but not actually demonstrating their life. So you look at how they fill their space. Things that are really, really important to them, they keep close in proxemics to their, within arm reach and into their intimate space, their personal and intimate space they keep. Like in your case, I'd be willing to bet that you're probably in front of your computer a lot or in front of a book a lot. So those are important to you. <clears throat> you're, they're, they're within reach. And something that's not important, you push away. So anything that's distal is something low importance and anything that's proximal is something very important. So the first thing is what do you fill your space with most and what's the common denominator and use of it? And that tells you what you value. The second one is time. You find time, make time, and spend time on things that are really valuable to you. But you don't want to take time for things that aren't. 
people constantly ask me, hey, can you come and do this social event or can you can do this or you can do that? I said, well, thank you, but I've got other priorities right now. I'd rather be teaching and researching and, and, and sharing. Yeah, I don't pass up speaking opportunities, but I'll pass up social events because that's not as high in my values. I'm reaching, my social life is, is this. This is my social life as far as I'm concerned. So you make time, find time, spend time on things that are valuable to you. And what you fill around your space and what you spend your time on will be a reflection. So I'm sure you fill your space, as you can see, with books and learning and knowledge, anything that can help people master their life. And you also spend your time filling your brain on that and sharing information about that, I'm sure, from what we can, we can see here. Then I look at how what energizes you. When you're doing something high in your value, energy levels go up. When you're doing something low in your value, energy is drained. So I look at what is it that energizes you most. And you in my case, learning and teaching is going to be high. We can do that. We can go at 9 out, 10 hours, 20 hours a day. I do 20 hours a day sometimes on that. No problem. And then I look at what you spend your money on. You find money, make money, and spend money on things that are valuable to you, and you don't want to spend money on things you don't. So that's why people that don't have a value on wealth building are going to keep spending their money on consumables that depreciate and never get ahead financially. But people that have a real value in wealth building, they buy assets, not liabilities and, and depreciables and consumables. So your hierarchy of values is showing your financial destiny. So you look at where your money's going, and that tells you what you value. The fourth one is what is it that you're most organized in and ordered in? You know, I can tell you your, your books are organized, and I have no doubt that you, you know, you have ordered information. You've structured the information. If you're doing book summaries, I've done thousands of book summaries. If you're doing book summaries, you're organizing knowledge, and organized knowledge is power, and that's valuable to you. So where do you have the greatest degree of order and organization that tells you what you value? And you probably have organized what books you're going to do and when you're going to do them, and you probably have that even organized. Then if you look at the next one, it's where you're most disciplined, spontaneously acting without extrinsic motivation. That tells you what you value. I, I'm spontaneously researching and teaching. I don't, I don't ever go a day without researching and, and somehow doing something. I don't care what day it is. Sunday, Saturday, it means nothing to me. I don't pay attention to one, the days of the week because every day is the same. I'm researching and teaching every day. And people say, what do you do to chill out? I don't need to chill out. This is what I love doing. So look at where you're disciplined, reliable, and focused, and you spontaneously act. That tells you what you value. The next three are what do you visualize, what do you think about, what do you visualize, and what do you internally dialogue with yourself about, about how you would love your life to be that is showing evidence of coming true. And it's important to make sure it's what you would love your life to be and what shows evidence. Because if I just asked you what do you think about, well, I think about my bills. I'm thinking about my, uh, my health problems. That's not what I'm asking. What are you thinking about, about how you would love your life to be that shows evidence of coming true? What are you visualizing about how you would love your life to be that shows evidence of coming true? What are you talking to yourself about how you would love your life to be that shows evidence of coming true? Your visual center is your occipital lobe. Your talking is in the temporal and the other is in the frontal. The thinking is in the frontal and parietal. So I'm looking at the whole brain in a gestalt manner. What is consistent in all those? Then the next one is, what do you converse with other people about most and keep bringing the conversation to socially? So if you go to a phone, uh, some social function, what do you want to lead the conversation to? And if they talk about it, you're engaged and stay there all night. But if you talk about something unengaging, uninspiring, and low on the values, you'll, you'll want to go home or you'll want to go and find somebody else to talk to. So if all of a sudden somebody comes up to you and says, look, I want to talk about um, daycare and, and diaper changing, you'll probably not be as engaged. But if somebody comes up to you and says, you know, uh, do you know anything about mastering life and about, you know, how to become a, a, an amazing achiever? You'll probably talk all night and take over the floor because that's what's high in your value. So you look at what you want to converse about. The next one is what is it that inspires you and brings tears of gratitude to you? And what's common to the people who inspire you and brings tears of gratitude? So if I look carefully, it's all the Nobel Prize winners, all the great philosophers, the greatest thinkers, and the people that have done the most extraordinary contribution on the planet. Those are the people I love studying and reading and watching videos of, etc. And that's what I want to do in my life. It's a reflection of what I want to contribute. So you look at what inspires you. Whenever you get a tear of inspiration, it's a moment of authenticity, and it lets you know what's highest on your value. And the next one is, what is it that's the most consistent, persistent goals you have that shows evidence of coming true? 
the ones that you're not stopping on and you don't let anything stop you from these goals and you're showing progress and making them come true. In my case, it's traveling the world teaching. I, I, I set out when I was 17, right before my 18th birthday, to travel the world and step foot in every country on the face of the earth. I still got 50 countries left, but I've gone 170 countries now. So that's a goal that I've been never stopping. I even live on the ship, you know, as it goes around the world, just so I can accomplish that. And so you look at what is that's persistent in your goals that you don't let anything stop you from. Not just any whim, but I mean the real goals that you are making it happen and you're not stopping on it and you're persevering. That's a sign of high value. And the last one is what do you spontaneously want to learn about, read about, study about, and watch on YouTube? There's a pattern. Yeah, I guarantee if you go into the newspaper, if you even read a newspaper, which you probably don't, you're only going to read a certain section probably. Or if you go to magazines, it's only certain topics. Or if you go to a bookstore, it's a certain area. It's self-help or it's personal development or entrepreneurship or leadership or anything to do with achievement. You don't go to the cooking class. You don't go to social history class. Those aren't what, that's not the priorities. So you look at what it is that you spontaneously want to learn about. And I guarantee if you answer those objectively, as if you're a drone looking over your life and looking at what you're actually are doing, not what you fantasize, there'll be a pattern that's so clear, it'll tell you what your life is demonstrating that's truly most important in your life. And it'll set up a priority. And that's why I want people to go on the website and take advantage of this because I've seen lives change from just that one exercise. Because the second you set goals that are incongruent and aligned with what you value most, once you know that, and you give yourself permission to prioritize your life in that direction, and start delegating lower party things, you will excel. And a lot of the self-depreciated behavior drops away. And it gives you the ability to go out and make a great living doing something you really love to do. I've yet to find a career path that, that is congruent with what somebody really has on their highest values that didn't produce. There's, I'm a believer that no matter what it is that you're inspired by, you can make a fortune out of it. I had a lady that just loved spending time with her dog turn it into a hundred million dollars, turn that dog into a celebrity, became one of the biggest dogs, the milk bone dog biscuit dog and end up with TV shows and, and the global awards. I mean, it was amazing this dog, but what she wanted to do, she started out with what is it I'd love to do and spend time with my dog. So we figured out how to make a career path out of that a hundred million. She generated out of being with her dog. So I'm a firm believer that it doesn't matter what it is. It's just what it is that's inspiring to you. You want to structure your life and build a career. Because whatever that is, there's a way of serving people with it. And if you're not serving people and doing something that contributes to people's lives, don't expect a lot of fulfillment in life. That's part of, that's half the equation. Yeah, thanks for sharing, John. And some of the notes I got from that was, you know, find out what you fill your, your space with, what you do with your time, what energizes you, what you spend your money on, where are you most organized, where are you most disciplined, what do you visualize, think about, and dialogue about in the future, what shows evidence, you know, think about loving your life, what you want it to be, what do you talk about, what inspires you, what's consistent, and what do you want to learn about as well. And I was going to ask, but you answered it, why is this important for people to understand their their values and their priorities? And it, I think you, you said it clearly, it's, you got one life, do what you want to do. You know, life's always, you shouldn't be wasting your time on low priority things. So I think it's really important to get that particular clear. Your, dis, your perceptions, your decisions, and your actions are based on your value. You filter your reality according to value, you make decisions according to your values, and you take actions according to your values, the spontaneous actions. So your whole behavior is based on your values. So if you don't know what your highest values are, you're going to subordinate to outside influences and try to be somebody you're not. And envy is ignorance and imitation is suicide. And if trying to put people on pedestals or pits instead of putting them in your hearts is going to stop you from doing something extraordinary with your life. So knowing your values, I think, is the greatest starting point for any great achievement. Also, you, you talk on a podcast about communicating your values too. You talk about the story about a, a mother and a son where the son was just playing video games and the mother wanted him to go to school and university. Can you talk about that story and how you connected you, you communicated with the mother about the, the values of the the child and then yeah can you talk about that particular story there was a lovely lady in brisbane australia who had a 16 year old son and she was an accountant and she was single and was raising this young man and came from an era where there's a lot of discipline she was italian she had a quite a disciplined life and she thought well you know my son's 16 it's time for him to go get a job because he's legally able to work and he was sitting there 
sitting in front of the video games and, you know, computer all day long. And of course, she was from an era that the computer wasn't the biggest thing. You know, we didn't grow up in the computer in my era as much. So, you know, he was more in touch with what goes on in the world of computers than she was. And she was thinking, well, you know, he needs to go get a job with a paper route or something, you know, some work in McDonald's or something like that, you know, the last decades of thinking. And so finally she said, look, uh, I'd like to hire you as a consultant and talk to my son and see if you can straighten him out. And I said, fine. So I went and chatted with him. I went into his room because I was at their house. I went to the room and I said, uh, seems like your mom's on your case. He says, yeah. I said, what are you working on? And he says, oh, I'm designing some video uh, code and everything else for a video game I'm designing. I said, so you actually write the code? He says, oh, yeah. I says, did you study that in school? Or was it, no, I just figured out how to do it. I wanted to do that. That's, that's been my dream to be able to create video games. And I said, so show me what you're doing. So I sat there with him, and after about 30 minutes, I realized this kid's freaking genius. I mean, he is like over the charts on what he knows how to do, and he's just rattling it off and just typing and creating code and creating it and doing this and changing. And uh, at the end of the hour, I came out of the room, and then she said, well, did you talk some sense in him, get him to go get a job? And I said, no, I hired him. <laughs> I hired a kid to do code for me on a project. And he ended up doing it. And um, I said, your son is a genius on computers and is ahead of the game, ahead of the curve. <clears throat> and I can tell you right now, he's not wasting time in this room. He's actually designing something that's going to be of vast value. So anyway, she was a little bit stunned by it. And she said, well, what do I do? And I said, see if there's a, a curriculum for him to go in that path. This is what he wants to do. We didn't grow up with that path. We didn't know about that path. So we're not, that's outside our radar, but let's, let's get him on that path. So anyway, I, then I didn't see her for quite a while. And about five years ago, maybe six, I was in Brisbane speaking at a conference there and he and his mother were in the very front row. And I didn't notice him at first. And I, all of a sudden I spotted him and I came down off the stage just to give him a hug. And uh, this lovely lady said, my son, he runs IBM. He makes more money than I do, my son. I went, wow. I got a tear in my eye. I hugged the son. He said, thank you that day. So sometimes we as parents project assumptions onto our children about what we think is important, thinking we're doing the right thing, but it's time to actually care enough about the child to find out what the intrinsic values of the child are and articulate what we think is important in terms of their values. And that makes a huge difference. That's why values are so important, the way we communicate with people. Thank you for sharing that story as well. And some of the things that I think about personally myself is everyone's on a different life path and trajectory and like myself, I've got a very long term time horizon, meaning I'm okay to put leave money on the table and not worry about money until I'm in my 40s, 50s, 60s. I'm not even interested in that because for me, the my value of teaching and researching is the highest priorities. You talk about your two quite a lot, which is teaching and traveling. I'm interested what sort of the third, fourth and fifth highest values in on your one, or if you just labeled it as two, I'm sure there's a couple others that, you know, what don't we know about yourself, John, in terms of your third, fourth, and fifth highest value? You know, when, when I look at my life, I, I started teaching this morning. At, I, I was up at two st teaching at three in Australia, actually. I finished at 7.30 uh, Ecuadorian time. And, um, and this is my third podcast, and I have a consult, and I have two more podcasts today. So I must spend my day doing what I love doing, um, teaching. So teaching is off the chart. That's something I do every day. And um, if I'm not teaching, I'm researching and writing. And I usually research, and I learn as I, and I type it, because I learn if I organize it and type it and put it in some sort of structure, immediately I tend to retain it. And if I teach it as soon as possible, that's even greater. So that's what I do. So that's number one. Number one is teaching. Number two is researching and writing. They go together. Three is traveling. And sometimes two and three are almost separate because I live on a ship that full-time travels. And if I'm not on the ship, I'm flying somewhere teaching. 
So I'm teaching here on the ship or I'm flying somewhere to go teach. COVID time, I've been doing Zoom and so I've been on the ship more, but, but uh, normally I'm also flying. Number four on the list is wealth building. And I had a dream to be financially independent doing what I loved. I didn't want to sacrifice what I loved for wealth building. I didn't want to just go make money and then not do what I really love to do. I want to do what I love and show people that they could become wealthy doing it. And so I want to exemplify that. So I'm very much financially independent today. I never, I would never have to work again if I didn't want to, but I have no desire to not work. I love doing what I'm doing. So I, I'm going to do that. Hopefully until the day I die. But that was number four. Number five comes in on, well, actually, five is a combination because my teaching allows me to have my social life. So reaching people is part of my teaching. So it's sort of entwined into teaching because that's my social life. So, but just socializing, going out and having a glass of wine with some, I don't do, I haven't drank in 50 years. I don't go party just socially that much. That's just not my thing. People invite me sometimes, but I, that's not my thing. I make that quick. So, so next is wealth building. And the next one is relationships. You know, having a relationship. So I have, my girlfriend's in Istanbul. She's flying over here in five days. So she'll be here in five more days. And, um, but she's a, a, a major actress and singer and uh, supermodel. So, so she's coming in and will be with me here in about six days, five, six days. So that's kind of the next one in, in line. Um, after that, it kind of dwindles down into other little things, but I pretty well spend most of my life teaching. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm teaching, researching, writing most of the days. And if my girlfriend's here, then that's a little bit less. Uh, my family and girlfriend, they go together, family and girlfriend, family and relationships. So my kids, now, luckily, my kids are all involved in what I'm doing, so I get to interact with them teaching. And uh, so, and uh, they're, they're all part of the equation. So I've been pretty blessed there. So that's, that would be number five. Yeah, perfect. Thank you for sharing, John. That's a little bit of an insight to yourself. And yeah, at the end of the day, I don't think you need more than five to, to worry about what your highest values are, because as you said, your lowest values are disorganized. And who wants to organize the lowest, dis, 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 you know, lowest value? Yeah, delegate those, of course. I delegate those. I haven't driven a car in 32 years, so I don't drive. I haven't cooked since I was 24. I don't do it. I have, on my ship, I have a, a private chefs. I got concierge service for transportation. I've got cleaning people. I don't do anything except teach, research, write. And that, and I've structured my economics, so there's no way I cannot be wealthy. And then I'm with my girlfriend when she's here or my kids. So I don't have to do anything else. I don't have any other responsibilities except what I love doing. It's perfect. And at the end of the day, that that's your lifestyle. And, you know, after researching, you know, 30,000 books and living sort of the, the life you've, you've done, you, you should you should be at that stage now where you're only doing the, the top values and delegating the rest of the stuff through there. So congratulations. That's something to, for me to look forward to when, when I'm your age as well. Now let's jump into, you You teach a great thing called the, the Breakthrough Experience Seminar. We're not going to go through most of it now, but let's just touch on some of the seven transformational tools which you teach. We've already spoke about the sort of um, Demartini value determination process, which, which you clarify what your life demonstrates that you're truly most important to you and get clear on your daily priorities. But what is the Demartini method? So that's a revolutionary new process in human transformation uh, for governing emotions, dissolving distractions, and transforming perceptions. Can you touch on the uh, Demartini method a little bit? I started developing that, even though it wasn't called that <clears throat> when I was 18. And I've been working on it all these 50 years. And it's a series of very precise, concise questions that make you conscious of unconscious information that you're overlooking in your awareness. So let's just say you're infatuated with somebody and you're conscious of the upsides, but unconscious of the downsides. So the Demartini method is asking what specific trait, action, or inaction do you perceive this individual displaying or demonstrating that you admire most? And you get very concise on what that is. And then you go to the next question. So go to a moment, John, where and when you perceive yourself displaying or demonstrating this precise behavior, this action, this trait, this inaction. 
And you have to identify where you've done it so you have reflective awareness and introspection until it's quantitatively and qualitatively equal. Because it's been shown for centuries, now three millenniums, we can find literature showing that we don't see in things in others unless it represents part of ourself. And so when we have the seer, the seeing, and the seeing of the same, and we have reflective awareness, we got more of an authentic view of life. And we're mindful, not emotionally attracted with impulses or repelled by instincts. Then we go in there and find out what are the downsides of these behaviors? And we neutralize them. Because if we're infatuated with somebody, they're going to run us. If we neutralize it, we're going to run us. So it's a step-by-step -step methodical series of questions that guarantees, and I mean guarantees, that you can take emotional baggage that's distracting you extrinsically and find the hidden order and become fully conscious and be present and be back on track with what's deeply meaningful and priority in your life. So it basically transforms apparent chaos into, hid into the hidden order, allows you to take distractions and emotions and turn them into thank you, I love you, about your own life, and allows you to get back on track with what is truly most meaningful to you. So it's a science of extracting meaning out of your existence and a science of how to live by priority and a science how to dissolve baggage of any form that you are distracting your life with. Anything that's stored in the subconscious mind, it shows in how to turn it into the superconscious mind. So I've been developing this and studying the neurology on this and sharing it with psychiatrists and psychologists and people all over the world for many decades now. And and I'm very inspired by it. I'm, I'm certain about it. I've done it on live on TV and on radio and you name it. And it's not failed. It doesn't fail. It's a science. Psychology is, as it is, stands today with the victim model is really, in my opinion, outdated. There's a new science, a new psychology that I'm, I'm bringing out to the world. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, thanks for researching that and bringing that out to the world as well. Definitely someone who's got emotional baggage on myself might have hidden, but uh, I haven't done it, so I'll definitely look into that as well. The next one, you talk about the Demartini loss and grief resolution process. Now, I know you've had a life experience losing your wife to cancer. Do you want to talk about sort of your experience with loss and grief and how you sort of come up with this resolution process in the Demartini method? I've been using that clinically since 1984. So that's almost uh, almost 40 years, 38 years I've been doing that clinically with people. But I first got inspired by the idea back when I was 14, believe it or not, when I was hitchhiking to California. That's when I first started noticing some of the ingredients that made this method. But this method, this grief resolution method, uh, I used in the people in Christ Church and the earthquake there, the tsunami in Phuket, the tsunami in Ishinomaki, Japan, the earthquake in Japan in 2017, uh, we've used it and it is a powerful tool on helping people dissolve grief. I make a statement that most people can't comprehend. I say that there's no human being that has to grieve more than three hours again on planet Earth. And people go, what? They can't believe that. In fact, a professor, two professors at uh, Keio University in Japan heard about it and they came to talk to me about it. And they say, we want to see this. We want to do a formal study on it and see if it's, it sustains. And so they put a pilot study together and we actually took people who had prolonged grief syndrome. And um, these people had had six months to six years of grief and we dissolved it in two hours and 17 minute average. And then they followed them for a week, a month, a quarter, the next quarter, next quarter for 18 months. No grief, 100% no grief. Never seen anything like about it. No, they never even imagined that was possible. And it doesn't matter when they had the grief or when that started, how long it's been. None of that really matters. It's the science on what grief is. I figured out exactly what grief is and how to dissolve it. And it's, there's absolutely no biological reason we have to have that. It's an animal behavior and it actually causes cardiovascular problems, immune response problems, skin problems, digestive problems, and cancers are, are associated with it, prolonged grief. So there's a way of dissolving grief because we only grieve the we only grieve the loss of things we perceive had more advantages and disadvantages. When somebody dies, uh, and they were yelling at you and screaming at you and maybe fighting with you at times, and maybe they ate and they left hair on the sink and they did these behaviors, you never hear anybody say, "Well, I miss their dirty hair in the sink. I miss their screaming at me." They only miss the parts they were infatuated with that supported their values. I miss their hugs. I miss their conversations. I miss their 
their their dinner engagements, their their love making, whatever. So people don't miss it. When Soleimani was killed by Trump, the Iranian uh, uh, you know general, the people in Ara Iran grieved the loss of him because they had him as a hero. In America, they had him as the number one terrorist, and they got rid of him. And nobody grieved in America over about his death because they perceived more drawbacks and benefits, but the people in Iran saw more benefits and drawbacks, so they're grieving. Five million of them came out to grieve. So we only grieve the perception of loss of that which we perceive to be more positive than negative, more kind and cruel, more this and that, positive over negative. So what I go in there is I neutralize those perceptions, and once they're neutral, the grief is gone. And, it, and people don't believe it's possible until they see it live. And I've had people on television, I did it right on television, I've done it on radio, I've done it right there and they just go, if I hadn't seen this, I wouldn't have believed this. And they can follow up on these people for any period of time and it's it's dissolved on that particular grief. So it's a new model. I, I, I have a new model in psychology that's a science. It's a reproducible, duplicatable science. It's not a wishy-washy talk therapy, victim thinking. The, the reason I'm screwed up is because my mommy there, none of that stuff. It's a methodical step-by-step -step process on how to dissolve emotional baggage and getting on with your life. Because everything that goes on in your life can be used as fuel, not, not uh, friction. Yeah, thank you for teaching that. And I'm sure there's a lot of people out there that could get a lot of benefit from that, definitely with loss and grief, and how to liberate emotional burdens and maximize resilient adaptability. The next one you talk about, the leadership formula, the, the five S's formula for great leaders to leave their immortal legacies. What are some of those five S's? I, I, I started out with five. My daughter's added two more, so she's teaching along with me, and she's kept it going. But it started out with knowing what your service is. The five S's stood, stood, stood for service. Know what your mission is on this planet, what you feel is your major contribution and service to the world, whether that's raising a beautiful family like Rose Kennedy from the Kennedy family, or whether it's uh, Nelson Mandela serving a country, or whether it's myself teaching like yourself, or whether that's uh, building a massive software company, or I don't care what it is, whatever your service is that you feel absolutely most inspired to contribute to the planet that you can't wait to get up and master and contribute. Finding out what that is is the first step, because that's where you're most congruent with your highest value. The second one is gaining specialized knowledge on it or surrounding yourself with the people that have the greatest knowledge in that field on that. So you are not branded as somebody that's, uh, you know, unaware. You, you want to be at the cutting edge of the knowledge and be at the frontier of innovation because you have specialized knowledge. Either you do it or you're surrounded with yourself with people that do it. You know, in my case, I love doing that, so I'll do it. But I also surround myself with some extremely bright people in the, around the world. Anytime I meet real scholars and leaders in any field of knowledge, I befriend them and I make sure that they send me anything that's new and cutting edge stuff that they do so I can keep abreast and I can keep uh, data on them. So then if I need something in that field, I can have them help me. So you want to surround yourself with great minds and you want to also be a great mind in, the, in your area of expertise. So that's specialized knowledge, study. The third one is the ability to speak because you can't leverage yourself if you're only speaking one-on-one, -on -one, but you can certainly leverage yourself if you're speaking one-on-many. And that gives you a competitive advantage. And, and so in my case, I can, you know, do reach 250 million people in a year doing podcasts and TV and radio and stuff. And I can outreach and touch people's lives that way. So I, I do my best to try to, to leverage myself through speaking. Your voice is the instrument the symphony of your life and you get to play your symphony if you can speak. And many people are frightened of speaking out because they're subordinating to people instead of standing on their shoulders. And I'm a, fir a firm believer that whatever you see in others, you have within you. And if you deny it, you're too humble to admit you have it. You're going to play small and withdraw from speaking out. And speaking out, as you know, you have a podcast, you know how impactful that can be. And then I'm sure you've received thousands of people saying, thank you, you changed my life. And that's deeply meaningful and reinforcing of something that's a contribution of your service. And it makes you want to go and learn more specialized knowledge. So they compound each other. The fourth one is the ability to sell. The, you know, what the selling means is caring. Many people have a misunderstanding of selling. They think it's somebody shoving down your throat something. That's not selling. That's a projection. That's an ineffective sales process. When you really sell something, it really means you care about another individual to find out what they need and find out how what you do serves them and how you can fulfill that need. So it's, it really means caring. And that means you're doing something that is meaningful to other people 
rewards of making a difference in people's lives in a fair, sustainable way that allows you to have an income doing what you love. And I'm a firm believer that if you're not doing what you love and doing something that contributes, you're missing out on a lot of fulfillment in life. So that would be the fourth one. The fifth one is learning how to save and invest in your life. Because if you don't save and then have money working for you and invest and have money and buy assets that go up in value, you're going to devalue your life away. And you're going to end up working for other people as a slave instead of working and have money work for you as its master. So I'm a firm believer. I've, I've lived very simple, very frugal, and saved the hell out of my money and invested and bought assets. If you value wealth building, you're going to buy assets. If you don't, you're going to buy consumables that depreciate, fill up space in a house, and a quarter of your house is filled up with stuff that you're paying for. I'm a firm believer in living simply and investing a lot until the investments are making you 10 times the amount of money you could do working. So now you're doing work because you love to, not because you have to. Yeah. I try to teach people how to do that. It's not that difficult. It's not rocket science. Yeah, thanks for sharing, John. And just the notes I got from that was, yeah, service, knowledge, know, know your mission, specialized knowledge, speak, sell, save, and invest. So thank you for sharing. The next one, you talk about the manifestation formula. used. You've used it for five decades to masterfully cr create and achieve the extraordinary life you're blessed to live. What is the manifestation formula? Well, the manifestation formula started out by notes I took from Paul Bragg that I was learning from when I started at 17. So he, he told me that, you know, what you think about, what you visualize, what you affirm and what you feel and what you take actions on have an impact on your destiny. And I listened to this guy speak for about a three week period. And I took notes uh, of what he said uh, with my own wording. And I created this formula back in 72, 73, beginning of 73. And I've used it ever since. So it's a combination of what I learned from him and then my observation over the years of developing it. There's a new movie that's come out called uh, How Thoughts Become Things. And I outlined this manifestation form in that movie. But this, um, but this is basically the, the structure. See, whatever's highest on your value, your mission of life revolves around. That's your highest value is your mission. It's, your, it's a thing you're called to do. Once you know what that is, your mind will automatically dominate your thought on that. Because your innermost dominant thought becomes your outermost tangible reality. And you think about most about what it is that's most valuable in your life. So if you have clarity of what that mission is and you dominate your thought on it, you will also activate the executive center, which activates the visual accessing systems in the brain. And you'll see it. You'll see a vision of it. That's why they said those with a vision flourish, those without a vision perish. So the second you are clear about your mission, you, you dominate your thought on it spontaneously, you will automatically see it. You'll see a vision of it. I've proven that in thousands of people. Then what you do is then you, the way you know you're clear on your vision is you can articulate it to somebody else where they can see it in their mind's eyes, you say it. That's a sign of a clear vision. And anytime you don't have a clear vision, you plateau in your journey. But the second their vision's clear, you break through the plateaus. When people say I'm plateaued in my business, it's because they're not clear where they're going. They've got a plateau in their thinking because they're not clear about their mission. <clears throat> so the second you can articulate it, that next one is, so it's thought, vision, and internal dialogue. The next one is how you feel. If you're grateful for what you're doing, you love what you're doing, you're inspired by the vision, you're enthusiastically working, you're certain about your mission, and you're present doing it, nothing will stop you. You will automatically, I call those the six transcendental feelings. Those are the things that allow you to make sure you, you have acceleration. Not Then what you do is then you, when you do, you get an inspiration. Now you're going to want to write down. We've all been inspired and had to write down what's on our mind. We spontaneously want to write down and plan out what we want when it's really meaningful to us. So I call that the planning process. And that is writing down exactly how you want your life to be. I live by design. I don't live by duty. I've master planned my life since I was 17 and laid out exactly how I wanted to create it. And I'm living it. And I tell people that you can master plan your life or you can let other people run it for you. You're either a master of your destiny or a victim of your history. So I live by design. I don't live by duty. And so I map out exactly how I want my life and make sure it's congruent with what I value most. So it's something I'm committed to getting. So I walk my talk, not limp my life. And I write that down and I get clear about it. Where do I want to do it? When do I want to do it? I keep metrics of everything I do. Every time I do a podcast, I put your name in, the name of the podcast, 
Every time I do a presentation, I document. Every time I do consulting, I document. Every city I go to, 2,050 cities. Every time I go into another country, I document. I keep records and metrics of everything that I set out to accomplish in my life. All the celebrities I've worked with, all the leaders, all the prime ministers, everybody I've gotten to work with, I document. So if I say I'm going to do something, if I don't see some sort of evidence doing it, I either refine my goal or I start refining my strategy. So I'm a firm believer in master planning your life and strategizing your life, because if you don't, if you don't fill your day with high priority actions and inspire you, it's going to fill up with low priority distractions that don't. And it doesn't, no one's going to get up in the morning and dedicate your life to your fulfillment. If you don't, no one is. So then I go and write things down in space and time, and that gives spontaneous action. And we automatically spontaneous action on things that are high in our values. And our energy goes up when we're doing something that's high in our values. So we have tons of energy and our pulmonary nuclei and our thalamus is a gatekeeper and filter of sensory information going into the cortex. And we automatically, when we're doing something that's high in our values, we filter out low priority stuff and get on and see the synchronicities of things, the people, places, things, ideas, and events that help us fulfill what's meaningful to us. And so that's why we automatically see synchronicities and have momentum building achievements coming from that. So I'm a firm believer in writing it down in space and time and then taking action with the energy on the resources. And then I'm a firm believer in documenting what you're grateful for every day, which I have the largest collection of gratitudes of anybody I've met on earth. And your self-worth automatically goes up when you're doing high value systems and you will manifest. It's a formula. It's been there. It guaranteed to work. It's just a matter of following it. I like how you said document the evidence, and that's something I do as well. And I document everything. I've been journaling for only thirteen years, but I've, I keep a journal two pages a day. So I'm writing a seven hundred and fifty page book every single year, and I've got thirteen years of them. So it's very interesting that you talk about documenting evidence. So that's something that I do as well. That segues into my next question, which you you talk about obviously the science of goal setting and achievement. But one thing I want to talk to you about is utilizing chunking and linking processes that initiate spontaneous and meaningful action. Can you talk about the power of sort of chunking and working on your highest, you know, value and priority as well? Anybody that lives by low priorities because of the unfulfillment of not doing high priorities, they'll, they'll activate their amygdala and the amygdala is the immediate gratification center, the desire center. And so you, you end up with immediate gratifying short term objectives. And if it's not pleasurable, you give up. This is where attention deficit comes in. That's why attention deficits and amygdala response. But when you're doing something high in your values, you start thinking long-term vision and you end up being patient and you expand your space and time horizons and grow. And eventually your goals get bigger than your life. And so you start creating immortal legacies in your mind. So I'm a firm believer that if you do not chunk whatever you're doing to whatever your highest values are, the space and time horizons will be short and you'll tend to procrastinate, hesitate, and frustrate until you get to those time horizons. So that's why you want to make sure you're clear about your objective. You chunk it down into small bites. Uh, you make sure that those bites are linked to what you value most and watch the different productivity levels. Your productivity will go up just by those three things. Yeah, it's amazing. So that, I always say don't yeah. waste your time on goals that aren't linked to your highest value. Don't waste your time on anything that's not really truly meaningful to you. It's going to be self-depreciative. I've only come to realize that as well, looking back at my goals for the last sort of 10 years and realizing, hang on a sec, if you focused on the, the top three highest priority goals, most of people's goals are just money related, meaning like money will solve most of the people's goals and your goal is someone else's lifestyle. So hang on a second, when you hit your goal, you're just going to be living a certain lifestyle. So focusing on the top goals will actually solve 80% of the lower goals as well. Or as you said before, you can delegate those goals to someone else. We don't have to do everything ourselves. Last question I've got for you before we run out of time is you talk about the purpose statement clarifier. What is the purpose statement clarifier? Well, I wrote my mission statement the first time in 1972. I was 17 years old the first time I wrote a mission statement. I have edited it and refined that original mission statement 80 times. I have each of those recorded and you can see the evolution of it. So what I say is write down what you start with what you know and let what you know grow. So I knew at 17 that I wanted to travel the world because I'd already been traveling. I knew I wanted to overcome my learning problems and I wanted to learn to read and teach and become intelligent. I also, because of what I met when meeting Paul Bragg, I knew I wanted to study these things called universal laws. So I wrote down those things that I showed 
my life is that now I have evidence towards and what was meaningful to me. And if I didn't see myself taking actions on it, I refined it. And if I saw myself taking actions on it, I still refined it. And I kept reading it and refining it, reading it and refining it, reading it and refining it. The last time I refined it was December of 2021. I've added one more word into it. My refinements are sometimes only words or tiny little phrase. But if I don't bring a tear of gratitude when I read it, I refine it until it's inspiring to me. And so I keep that as a mission. And if you look at my mission statement and you look at my life, they're one and the same thing. There's no distinction. So I'm a firm believer that you can define how you would love your life and get clear about what the mission is that you want to contribute and friggin' create that in your life. Not everybody believes that's possible because most people set up fantasies and they try to write things that are just whims instead of write something that's deeply meaningful, that's truly inspiring from within, that's congruent with their values, highest values. So that's why I spend so much time on the values. That's why I tell people to go to the value determination process because it's the best place to start this journey. Yeah, thank you for sharing, John. And one thing I, I like what you said, which was write what you know and let it grow. So continue to, you know, edit and adjust as life moves forward as well. And last question before before you go. So you're on the hit documentary or the movie The Secret. What is one thing that people don't know about The Secret or The War of Manifestation? Really, really simple things that a lot of people think it's, you know, it's hoo-ha, but, but what is one thing that they should know about it that's absolutely true? Well, the original secret um, never hit the air. The original secret was done out of Melbourne with Channel 9, and it was going to be a of 2006. But the Commonwealth Games bought out the time, and so the original secret only had six people in it. So what they did is they created a new version of it, watered it down, simplified it, put in 30-something people in it, and went out on DVD and went viral, which it became historical because it reached so many people. But the original movie was not anything like what you see today. It was a lot more in depth and more, more uh, you know, it would never have sold as well the way it originally was. So that was the perfection of the whole thing. But it got watered down and it took out a lot of the action steps and was a little bit more for the mass market. And so it, it didn't get the greatest rap because people were saying, well, you know, that's kind of superficial, you know, just visualize things and expect money to come in. There's a lot of people that lived in a delusion that, you know, I'm going to visualize the my mailbox filled with a million dollar check and they're wondering why it's not showing up. They're going out there every day waiting for a check. And I said, well, if you consider trying working and doing something worthy of a million dollars, you'd probably go farther. So there was some refinement and clarification that I think was the secret behind the secret left out of the secret that came along, but it didn't matter. What Rhonda Byrne did by putting that together and editing that down with, with you know, who, who, uh, Drew Harriet, uh, made history. I mean, it, it impacted people all over the world, and it started a, a ball rolling of people taking command of their life. And yes, there was some fluffy parts of it. Yes, it wasn't as detailed as it liked, and yes, it didn't throw enough action steps in there, but it started the ball rolling. And then people like us were going out and clarifying where we thought the weaknesses of the movie. Because the movie is not what everybody was saying. It was just a condensation of it for an hour and a half show. But still, it made a difference in the world. It made a dent. And I'm very grateful that I had the opportunity to be part of that. Because it did help me touch more people's lives. I think everybody out there started. In fact, I just met a lady from Panama. Because we coming into Panama. And she flew into Panama into to Ecuador the other day. And I just saw her last night. She says, are you that guy on that movie, The Secret, from 2006? I said, I am. She goes, I recognize you. I said, my 15-year-old son was watching that the other night. And I just all of a sudden, I look, you're the guy. And I said, yeah, I'm a little older, <laughs> many years older, but so what? You know, it's 16 years ago. But, but the point is, it served a purpose. It stimulated an idea, but it needed to be cleaned up and polished and additional material on there, in my opinion. Yeah. That's why the how thoughts become things, which is a sequel to the secret, is now in more depth. Yeah, looking forward to that coming out. John, I don't want to keep you too much longer, but thank you for sharing your knowledge and all the work you've done over the years and continue to teach, research, travel, and live the life that you're living as well. So yeah, thank you for being a guest on the Best Book Bits podcast. To my audience out there, just go and Google John Martini, and uh, you'll see all his content, books, and all these things up there. So John, thanks for being a guest, and uh, I'll let you get on with the rest of the day in teaching. So thanks so much for being a guest on the Best Book Bits podcast. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thanks for the great questions. No problem.